the first revolution that we're going to talk about is the scientific revolution. And the scientific revolution is uh, a series of huge scientific advances where they made big, big advances in the 1500s and the 1600s. And really, it kind of started out with um, a bunch of people having different approaches to science, taking a different look at science. And so <clears throat> uh, we'll start off by talking about Sir Francis Bacon. He's this guy up top, okay, and he is, um, is one of the first people to come up with the idea that the only way to do science is to observe, watch things happening, and then interpret what happens um, for yourself. You can't just come up with an idea and say that's science. You have to actually do experiments. You have to observe and interpret those facts. Rene Descartes is the second guy here, and he said that you need to use logic and reason to develop theories. So to create these theories, you need to use your logic and your reason, um, and then you can decide if those theories are true, you know, or not true. Okay. And so uh, the the third person here is probably the most important, and you've learned about him probably in science class. His name is Isaac Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton is responsible for creating the scientific method. And the scientific method is seven steps. And so hopefully you can write these steps down as I'm saying them. If not, you can always uh, click back and re-listen to them. But the first one is to state the problem. The second is to gather information about the problem. The third is to form a hypothesis, which a hypothesis is a guess, so you're guessing what it should what should happen. The fourth one is to experiment. The fifth one is to record and analyze the data, so you're writing it down and trying to figure out what it means. And then number six is state your conclusion. And then number seven is to share your conclusions. It was very important that they did number seven because then that allows other scientists to check it and make sure that it's um, a legitimate theory um, or not a legitimate theory based on what you figure out. Um, Isaac Newton also studied and came up with laws of motion and gravity as well. That was kind of his main area. Before the scientific method, um, the uh, main way of figuring out what was happening in science and in the earth was from the Catholic teachings, what the Catholic Church was teaching. And these medieval scientists from the Catholic teachings were saying what they thought was that the sun and the stars went around the earth, that the earth was the center of the universe. It's called geocentric. And so they thought the earth was the middle and everything goes around us. Um, however, Nicholas Copernicus in 1543, a Polish scientist, said, you know what? I don't think that's true. I think that the planets all go around the sun. And he argued this out with many different people. Now, um, the person who actually took it to the next level, this theory, was Galileo Galilei. And Galileo Galilei, he agreed with Nicholas Copernicus that the Earth orbits the sun, and he took all the information that he could that proved it, and he put it into a book. Okay? And when he put it into a book and published it, published his evidence, like you're supposed to do with the scientific method, the Catholic Church was mad about it because it went against what they were teaching. And so they actually put him on trial. And so when the Catholic Church put him on trial, uh, you know, he was up for execution. It was possible that he would die because of um, his beliefs in this, and he thought it wasn't worth dying over. And so he ended up signing a document saying, uh, what I said before was wrong, it's false, even though he knew it was true. And um, he signed this document so that he could save his own life. The next revolution of thought that we're going to talk about is the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was the idea of that humanism that we talked about from the Renaissance, where we're focusing on humans. And what it was was applying this observation from the scientific method into human affairs, so things that humans dealt with on a daily basis. And so a bunch of people started to experiment, observe, do all these things, and write about society and governments in the 1600s and the 1700s. And that was the Enlightenment. They started to look into how does society work? How do we decide which people are wealthy and, and nobles and which people are peasants? 
And so um, it was all about the people's involvement in the world. And the idea was that nothing was beyond the human mind. The human mind could do anything. Okay. And so <clears throat> a couple of enlightenment thinkers here, we'll talk about them over the next couple of slides, is the first one is Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes believed in kind of an interesting thing, really. He believed that um, people are selfish and greedy and they'll get, they're going to do nasty things unless we have a strong leader. So they said you have to have a strong leader in charge of the government with these strong laws. Otherwise, people are going to go completely crazy. It's going to be like the, the purge or something. Okay, He said without someone to make rules, it's going to be a nasty, brutish death with a violent end. Or, or sorry, a, a nasty, brutish life with a violent death at the end. So um, that's what Thomas Hobbes believed, that people are just naturally like that. John Locke uh, believed also that there were three unalienable rights and we've talked about these before last year in seventh grade um, and these are unalienable means you cannot take them away from people you're not allowed to take these away from people um, and those are life liberty and property so you cannot kill someone you cannot take away their life you should not be able to enslave someone to take away their freedom and you should not be able to uh, legally steal from someone, take away their property. And so he said those are the rights that every human should have. Uh, some more Enlightenment thinkers, Charles Louis Montesquieu, he believed that the power of the government should be separated into branches, one of them uh, making the laws, that would be the legislative branch, one of them enforcing the laws, the executive branch, and one of them interpreting the laws, the judicial branch. Um, that's kind of what he looked for, and as you can see, this kind of adds into that idea of um, uh, America's system. Okay. Uh, the second person is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Both of them are pictured up here. Um, and he said that the government only works because the people allow it to work. One person could not govern a, a whole group of millions of people if those millions of people didn't want him to because they could easily kill him. Okay, And so it's the idea of popular sovereignty. The people are in charge. No government can control people that are unhappy, essentially. Um, and so that's another principle of our constitution that's why i had the american flag here all of these are kind of uh things that america has done also um there were also some rulers that were really enlightenment thinkers and and the ruler frederick or that made positive changes the ruler frederick ii of prussia which is now kind of germany area um believed that uh, we should have better education, so he built up his education system and got rid of torture, uh, cruel and unusual punishment like the U.S. got rid of. Um, Joseph II of Austria got rid of forced labor. He said we shouldn't have slavery no matter who the people are, whether we think or we caught them in a war or not. This was also a period of violent change. There was definitely some violent stuff going on. Um, and one of these democratic revolutions where people wanted to get rid of everything and switch to democracy happened in England. And it happened over the course of a long period of time. Um, it started off with the parliament slowly taking power from the king. Uh, and King Charles I was forced to sign the Petition of Right in 1628. And in 1628, he sent this, or he signed this, and what that did was right here okay it ended illegal taxes on people that that the people didn't want these taxes so it, it ended that and it ended illegal imprisonment just grabbing people just because the conflict that followed the petition of right being signed led to a civil war now eventually and that civil war happened in 1642 eventually in 1649 the king was captured and the king was executed king charles the first um and at that point um england became a republic and so um over the next 40 years there were a number of changes and King Charles's son ended up taking over. And uh, with him taking over, there came new conflict about the king taking too much power. And so they had to make a decision on how do they fix this issue so that it wasn't every 20 to 30 years they had this bloody war. And so um, what they did is they offered two people, William and Mary. They said, you can be, they were nobles and they were you know, able to be king or queen. And they said in 1689, we will make you the king and the queen 
if you sign the English Bill of Rights, which the English Bill of Rights gives certain rights to English people in Great Britain and England, okay, it, it gives them the rights forever. And so basically what the English Bill of Rights did is it limited the power of the monarch, made the king or queen way less powerful, and it listed all of the rights of the people and of the parliament so that the kings could never take those away because now it's written down. Okay, uh, the French Revolution was also happening at this time, another very bloody revolution. And what happened is the French society was uh, set up in three different groups. The, they were called the three estates. And the first estate was the clergy. Clergy are people, religious people. So the people that are part of the church um, were, were the top estate. They had the most uh, power, basically. And then the second estate was very close to them and also had a lot of power. And those are the noble people, the rich people, the people whose families have been rich for a very long time. And so they had a good last name that everybody looked up to and respected. And then the third estate was just regular everyday people. Okay. And so most of us, you know, in the school are probably would be in the third estate if we were in uh, revolutionary France. And what happened is the nobles and the clergy were making all the rules. And so they were making the common people pay tons of taxes and not have all the rights that they deserved. Okay, And all of these common people were just taking it until they started to think about these enlightenment ideals. Okay, And all these ideas that we've just been talking about, and they thought, oh, well, maybe we need to make some changes. Okay, And so so the French people said, we want a voice in government. The third estate wanted a voice in government. And Louis the 16th, the king at the time, said, no, I'm going to be an absolute ruler. You can't tell me what to do at all. And so the French Revolution followed that. On July 14th of 1989, um, the, a mob of third estate people stormed the Bastille. The Bastille was a prison in Paris, and so they were trying to break people out of this prison. And um, that started the French Revolution. It was a very bloody war in which the common people, the third estate, uh, kind of took over. And in that time, there was a, a time called the Reign of of terror in particular in 1793 where thousands of people were executed they would take all of the first and second estate people and punish them for all the years that they had been um you know given unfair taxes and things like that so they took all of the noble people men and women and and killed them and what they used was the guillotine and the guillotine you're going to need to know what that is because i'm going to ask you with the picture um, but the guillotine is this right here. And what happens is they have a giant blade with a big heavy block on top of it. And you put your head or they put your head through right here. Okay. And they lock you in. So your head is stuck there. And then they release this right here with that string. And the weight of this big wooden block pulls the big sharp blade down and it cuts your head off and your head falls into this basket. So that's how they would um, execute people throughout the French Revolution. So um, the French Revolution, while that was happening, Napoleon Bonaparte was rising, rising quickly through the French army. And he was a, um, per, an artillery man, so he shot cannons basically for a job. Um, and by 1799, he took over. He had moved up through the army, and he took over as a dictator. He led the army against the people and, and took over. Um, and so he tried to build this empire, this huge area in Europe. And as you can see over here with the purple, um, all that purple area was his so uh, at the height of his empire it was really really big and they had taken a lot of the land um, however in uh, what he ended up trying to do at the end in in like 1814 is he moved into Russia okay and he attacked Russia and what the Russian troops did is they backed up and 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 you know didn't really end up having to fight uh, Napoleon in a decisive battle because his lines got so long and his 
you know, his people, his troops got so far away from France that now all of a sudden it was really hard to get all the food and supplies and bullets and stuff like that to them because there would be Russians there harassing the supply lines. Okay, and so they'd be trying to take food in these wagons and Russians would come and destroy the wagons and and they'd have to just keep going and trying to get in there and it turned into winter and Russia's winters are really harsh and so um, eventually it led to Napoleon and having to be defeated and retreat in 1815 and later on he was um he was kicked out of the country essentially um and sent to a small island where he would live the rest of his life uh, however what this caused is a start to nationalism and democracy all across Europe. Okay, and so uh, the people, that idea of people having pride in their own country and wanting to be democratic, wanting to run themselves, was came from um, this empire. Was kind of the last one before that big, big uh, push towards uh, democracy. The Industrial Revolution was the next one to come, another peaceful one, and the Industrial Revolution is a shift from hand tools and tools driven by animals to, or, or humans, power, <coughs> to machines that were run by fuels, things like steam, gasoline, electricity, stuff like that. And um, some of these, uh, or what happened is the technology increased a lot, and so life changed completely. Some of the changes that came from this technology is things that were used to be made in the home could now be made faster and cheaper in factories. So you people had a lot more time because they were used to be making clothes and making soap and making everything at home, but now the factories can make them much faster and much cheaper and much better. So you just bought those at the store. So men and women were both working and everything was happening like that people the societies became more productive also the coal and steam powered trains and boats made for better transportation so they could move uh, against the current or against the wind and it didn't matter because they weren't trying to either row with oars or use sails to move in whatever direction that they needed to so the industry growth caused a lot of changes um, throughout Europe and one of them was there were new factories and these factories were set up in places with good transportation cities that had good transportation in them that had so like uh, canals or rivers were close by railroads things like that uh, a lot of people and good resources that they needed to make the things with. And what ended up happening is people needed the jobs, they wanted the jobs, and so they moved to these big cities. And the cities got really, really full, and actually they got over full, and so there were really bad living conditions in the cities. They were crowded, they didn't have good services like trash and fire departments and all that kind of stuff was not very good. And so it was kind of bad living conditions, and then the working conditions were bad too, where there was dangerous working conditions um, and they had to do long hours and sweatshops and children were working and it was just uh, overall bad labor conditions. However, things weren't all bad. Um, there were a lot of good things too. Uh, science, scientific breakthroughs during the industry or during industrial revolution allowed us to realize that germs cause diseases which helps us to avoid a lot of diseases it also brought about the age of electricity so now we have uh, electricity which is very important to all of us every single day it brought the cost of living down and it increased education as well so there was a lot of positive things that the industrial revolution brought as well